for joining us at our uh, LAC June 5th. It's been an interesting day. It's been an interesting month and certainly we've had a very, very interesting shelter in place process for the last two, three months. Time flies. Thank you for joining us. We have some uh, interesting things to talk about. And first off, I want to uh, uh, introduce our CEO, Anjali Kauser. And uh, Anjali, uh, is there uh, something you wanted to say uh, this afternoon? Yes, thank you, Rich. In light of the recent events, I would like to take a moment to read this statement on behalf of our board of directors. The killing of George Floyd and numerous other black people is a tragedy, tragedy that continues to strike at the heart of American society. These racist acts impact everyone across the nation and no one as much as our black community members. We collectively mourn and seek justice with and for our fellow Americans. Business leaders, community leaders, and residents must all actively work against racism and its effects. We are responsible for creating a society in which people of all racial backgrounds can pursue happiness, live without fear of violence, and thrive economically. We in Cupertino stand in solidarity with the Black community members locally in Silicon Valley and with all people seeking justice and peace. Thank you. Thank you, Anjali. We have um, plenty to talk about. Uh, for those of you that have been following the Chamber of Commerce, we have um, uh, we have uh, had a recently had a forum with uh, West Valley mayors uh, from Sunnyvale, Santa Clara, and Cupertino, and the topics that have come up have been all critical, all over the board, and all incredibly important. So there's no shortage of things to talk about. So um, uh, perhaps it's, it's appropriate that uh, one of the more important issues that we have to talk about is, is taxes. And we have one of our uh, uh, more experienced community leaders in Silicon Valley to, to, uh, to talk about that. And of course, uh, I'm talking about uh, our county tax assessor, Larry Stone. And for those of you who know, uh, one of the important things to do uh, whenever the county tax assessor, not just Larry, but any county tax assessor is presented is to to, have, to share a resounding boo, and there's no way to do that verbally, but feel free to share your thoughts on the chat. Um, if you have questions, as uh, undoubtedly you will, please share them um, on the question and answer uh, section at the bottom of your screen, and we can, um, we can uh, share those for you or you can raise your hand and we will call on you as uh, the meeting um, and the opportunities arise. So with that and no further ado, uh, Larry, over to you. All right, just a moment. I'm having some technical difficulties here. There we go. Okay. All right, well, good afternoon. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, I've been doing this uh, several times over the last few years. So I'm going to talk about uh, the split roll ballot initiative, which recently qualified for the November ballot. Uh, you know, I was a strong opponent of Proposition 13 ballot measure in 1978. You know, Proposition 13, in my opinion, is one of the two worst things that has happened to California. As a young Sunnyvale council member in 1978, I actively, actively campaigned against Proposition 13. I also believe there are significant inequities between assessed values and property taxes paid by commercial and property and industrial property owners versus residential properties, all created by Proposition 13. Many commercial and industrial property owners don't pay their fair 
or equitable share of the property taxes. I'm asked then why I oppose the split roll ballot measure when I openly acknowledge these inequities, allowing commercial property owners not to pay their fair share of property taxes. Well, my job as the assessor is to, is to let 1.9 million people, 800,000 registered voters, and 500,000 property taxpayers know that the split roll ballot measure is seriously flawed and would create chaos for assessors, taxpayers, and California property tax system. If I didn't do that, I would be criticized for remaining silent. The one good thing, maybe the only good, only good thing about Proposition 13 is property taxes are predictable. The split rule would create significant unpredictability for schools and cities. This, as, as the split rule is drafted, it would be impossible, not difficult, but impossible for assessors to implement. The problem is not with the intent to raise more revenue for schools and local government, or to eliminate the inequities created by Proposition 13. I support that objective. The problem is with the convoluted attempt to exclude several classes of property taxpayers. Most of these exclusions are politically motivated. It excludes, for example, all residential properties, including multifamily apartments. Well, apartments are income properties, more like shopping centers and office buildings, not like homes. Why? Well, because apartment renters vote and they, would, and they would receive significant increases in rent if the ballot measure passes. It excludes from reassessment, for example, small businesses. That sounds good, doesn't it? Well, most small businesses do not own property. Many pay their property taxes through their lease. So most small business tenants wouldn't get the benefit of the exclusion. The intent of the split role is to get companies like Intel, Disneyland, Hewlett Packard, companies with very low assessed values because they've owned their property for pre-Proposition 13 to pay a fairer share, if you will, of property tax. At the same time, however, the split role initiative will crush tens of thousands of California small businesses. The independent restaurant, the cleaners, the hair salon or nail salon, the grocery store, the small account, even nonprofits, could face increases in property tax by eight, nine, even 10 times. <clears throat> so how does the initiative define a small business? Well, it defines it by a business with less than 50 employees statewide. Now I can't tell you or validate the number of employees in any company in my county, let alone statewide. The split role excludes owner-occupied owner property in which the fair market value is less than $3 million statewide. Well, first, assessors only know the fair market value of property twice, at the change of ownership or new construction. After that, we only track assessed values. Assessors cannot determine the aggregate fair market value of multiple properties in multiple counties. There is a real, there, there is a related problem. The $3 million cap is adjusted biannually by county based upon a local inflation factor determined by the State Board of Equalization. The result, different inflation factors in different counties. So you can have identical properties, say two identical Taco Bells built at the same time in adjacent counties, say one in Palo Alto and one in Menlo Park, often just three or four miles apart with different county inflation factors. The result is exact properties will experience different assessed values over time. The ballot measure provides a three-year deferral for small businesses, but only, but, only small bus but only small businesses that own their property. Most of them don't. The ballot measure provides that if the mixed-use property is 75% residential, then it may be excluded. 75% today, 50% tomorrow. Does the property then lose its total e exclusion? The ballot measure requires reassessment of all commercial properties to market value every three years. That's the main concept of the ballot measure. Well, what happens if the Great Recession or a pandemic occurs in year two and property values drop 50% as they did during the Great Recession? 
requiring annual review of each individual property, eliminating the benefit of spreading reassessments over three years. Assessment appeals would skyrocket. At the very least, every commercial property owned prior to say two, 2008, just pick a date, would file an appeal. Why not? Much to be gained with very little risk. In Santa Clara County, we received 2,100 commercial appeals last year. That's fairly normal. We conservatively project that we will receive 25,000 in the first year after a massive reassessment to market value of commercial properties. It would be impossible for Santa Clara County to resolve 25,000 assessment appeals. We would be overwhelmed. To respond to the huge increase in assessment appeals, assessors, including this one, would transfer appraisal resources from enrolling new construction and changes of ownership where the real, where the real revenue is to defending high dollar appeals, jeopardizing current property tax revenue. The split role is an invitation to adjudicate disputes in court rather than before a local assessment appeals board, creating a monumental increase in the cost and timing of resolving assessment appeals would also make the resolution of routine residential appeals take much longer. I would have to double my appraisal staff. That's 50 new senior appraisers. In Los Angeles County, that's 480 new experienced appraisers. It takes five years for me to train and prepare an entry level appraiser to be qualified to appraise commercial properties. The ballot measure gives us just 18 months. An experienced appraisal skill set doesn't exist in, in the industry today. The appraisal profession has been on a uh, has been going downhill since the SNL debacle in the early 1990s. For the past three years, assessors have been doing a deep dive into the financial and workload workload requirements of a split role. First, we surveyed assessors regarding the impact the split role would have on staffing and workload. Then we commissioned a nonpartisan independent analysis by Capital Matrix, which concluded that our estimates were way low and the estimated cost to implement the initiative over the course of the proposed three-year phase-in is just over $1 billion statewide. That does not include the commensurate increase in costs for county controllers, tax collectors, assessment appeals boards, or other county councils. The 1978 Proposition 13 initiative was very short, just 44 words. Even at that, it took the state two years to create the statutes and rules for its implementation. If it took two or more years to complete the split role logistics, including advancing funds to cover assessors' startup costs, that would be six months after the, dead, after the date of the first required reassessment. So I'm often asked, is there an alternative to the split role that would generate additional revenue for schools? Yes, there is, a split rate. Simply change the tax rate for all commercial property to 1.2%, 1.3%, even 1.5%. It could be done overnight with none of the problems and complexities that I mentioned that the split role would cause. It would generate additional property revenue beginning next year. You know, whenever government promises something that can't be achieved, it just increases the mistrust and cynicism that the public has toward government and elected officials like me. This is a seriously flawed ballot measure and should be defeated. And we should seriously consider if you believe that schools and local governments should receive more money, we should seriously consider the split rate rather than the split role. Uh, I'll be now be happy to any, answer any questions you have about the split role or anything else that has to do with the assessor. Well, it's, uh, while people uh, think of their questions, uh, one of the uh, questions I know that has come to mind is, um, I've heard others ask is, uh, You've been incredibly effective advocating, and I think you came out very early at identifying fundamental flaws in this, in this measure. Are there other organizations, are there other uh, tax assessors that are 
um, also sharing your view. The California Assessors Association, which includes all 58 county assessors in California, last week uh, formally opposed the split role. Again, not because of the tax issues uh, or the revenue issues at all, simply on the basis of the impossibility for us to be able to implement it. And as I said, uh, this is not gonna happen. And, and it's too bad because the schools need more money, I believe, as does local government. Uh, and it's too bad because people are very excited about the prospects of this. And I can tell you for the reasons I stated earlier, it's not gonna happen. Uh, and so people are gonna be very disappointed on November 4th. Now the opposition uh, are people that I, I normally don't align myself with, uh, like Caltax and the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association and, and so forth. Uh, but, and, and, and you know, they have some good points in their opposition, but they also will be misleading in their opposition because they will say this is the foot in the door that, you know, the next thing, prop, the, you know, the, the elimination of Prop 13 on residential property owners, which is, which is on residential property, which is nonsense. The people have to vote for, an, for any change in Proposition 13. And it's un, highly unlikely that people are gonna vote to eliminate uh, the, the Prop 13 protections on their own homes. But that's the argument they will use. I am told that the opponents, which are mainly commercial industrial property owners, uh, as well as the organizations I mentioned, will spend up to or more than $100 million to try to defeat this. And a lot of the arguments made to do that are simply not true. That's unfortunate for somebody like me, who is also opposed to the measure, but, uh, but certainly doesn't believe uh, that, uh, that, that Proposition 13 protections on residential property owners uh, is under, is in jeopardy at all. All right, thank you. We have a question from, um, from our audience. Uh, Dennis Sima, the executive director of the Foothill De Anza Foundation, uh, was asking if you had, uh, or could share some uh, quick fiscal state of the county comments. Uh, your takeaway from what we are all seeing from the economic fallout from the COVID-19 situation. Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, just a little short uh, lesson on what the, what the assessor does. I'm constitutionally required, as all assessors are, to close the, our assessment roll every year on July 1st, uh, based upon values as of January 1st. So the assessment roll, which we will close in what, about three weeks, I guess, and we will do it on time, and as we, all, as we always have. Uh, uh, the, so the, the values are, are pre-COVID-19, January 1st, 20. 20. Uh, so the assessment roll will be up about 6%, which actually is a little bit higher than I thought that it would be. We, you know, we, we were entering uh, what, you know, what I called, I think, when I talked to you last year, a normal recession, which is anything but now. Uh, so we'll be up about 6, 6.5% this year, uh, which is less than we've seen in the last few years, but still very strong. The bloodbath will occur next lean date, January 1st, 2020, 2021. And that's when you'll see the diminution of value of all types of properties, more on the commercial side than on the residential side, but, but surely across the board. Uh, and so it will be uh, bad. Uh, and there's a possibility that the, that the California Consumer Price Index, which is the basis for the annual 2% increase. In other words, Proposition 13 provides that assessed values cannot be 
uh, increased by, by more than 2%. Well, uh, only about 10 times in the 41 years since Prop 13 passed was the, was the California Consumer Price Index less than 2%. In 2010, during the Great Recession, it was slightly negative. There's a possibility, and I can tell you the consumer price index this year will not be 2%, it will be less. And there's a possibility it could be negative given the impact on the economy. Uh, and so that in itself means that uh, in 2010, everybody, uh, every property owner of all types received a reduction in their assessment right at the time when schools, local government, and the economy in general needs money, more money. So that, that just plan for that. If you're in schools, community colleges, government, uh, there, there are deficits across the board. There'll be cuts in staff, they'll be re reduced in budget. I think we're, we're looking at, at the county I think I heard over a $200 million deficit this year. The state is something like $58 billion. Uh, and, and not much ahead in terms, you know, until we get uh, COVID-19 under control. Uh, not much uh, good news ahead. Right. Well, Larry, so it sounds like there's some latency in the system. So we'll, uh, local agencies may see a bigger hit coming the next budget round. Definitely will. Okay. Well, we ha I'll have a, a questions coming in back to the uh, split role. And uh, from uh, Luis Bueller, um, he read that commercial properties with more than 50% occupancy by small businesses would be excluded. How would this affect malls or and or any idea about how many small businesses are quote unquote protected by this? Uh, well, if I understand uh, the question, if you're in a mall, it's the, it's the mall owner, usually a large company that pays the taxes. And as I mentioned earlier, most of the small tenants uh, or even the large ones are, are the large anchors are on triple net leases. So they pay their pro rata share of property tax in their lease. Uh, malls are, I mean, retail is probably the hardest hit at it all. I, I don't think retail will ever fully recover. I have a, I have a, uh, uh, you know, a retail research analyst who I respect projects that 30% of all 1100 malls in this country will close in the next four years. Uh, a la Valco, I guess. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure that I'm fully answering the question, but uh, you know, if more than 50% occupancy by small businesses could be excluded, well, they wouldn't be excluded. Um, th there would be a delay of four years. I don't know if that makes small businesses feel comfortable uh, that you know, they're not gonna get hit with an increase of eight, nine, or 10 times be just because it's delayed for four years. Okay, well, thanks. I, I'm gonna ask people to, uh, I have a, about a half dozen more questions for you and, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, like to move on from there, but at, you've gotta be used to so many questions coming with what is a, a, an innately complicated and counterintuitive process. Um, so John Tang from San Jose Water asks, are there any polls which show uh, which way voters are leaning currently? Yes, there is. Um, well, the one that I refer to the most because until yesterday, uh, uh, it was the last one I've seen. And it's kind of interesting. The, the poll that I saw, I think it was in March, 56% of California residents believe that schools need more money. And only 45% of, of those same uh, people polled are in favor of the split role. Uh, 
So that begs the question, I guess, is what's another alternative like the split rate? Now, let me say this first, because I didn't say it about the split rate. It won't raise as much money as predicted by the split roll, but the split roll is not going to raise that much money anyway, because it's not going to happen uh, at, you know, for several. In, in, in fact, the, 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 uh, the legislative analyst uh, said yesterday that the revenue projected by the split rule, even if it occurred, would not come in until 25, 2025 or 2026. Well, look, well, the schools who, who support this uh, expect that revenue to come in in, in, you know, in 18 months because the ballot measure says that the first reassessment has to occur by January 1st, 2022. Well, the LAO who's analyzed this on an independent objective basis says at the earliest, uh, the revenue wouldn't be here for four more years. So again, I would advise school, schools and local government not to budget the revenue they expect or is projected from the split roll. Great, thank you. Um, there was a question about, is this a, a simple majority vote? Yes. It is, okay. And, um, uh, and then lastly, uh, actually you answered this, when would it take effect? Uh, not for a while. Well, it, it, you know, the measure says that the effective date of the first reassessment would be January 1st, 2022. Uh, so that's why if it passes on November the 3rd of this year, then the assessors have about 18 months or so, maybe a little bit less to begin the process. But as I said, uh, I would have to double my appraisal staff. And, and, and as, as I also said, the skill set in the appraisal business doesn't exist now. And you know what? With 25,000 appeals, a lot of money's at stake. And so, uh, you know, you, I mean, right now, we have about, about 5,000 appeals today of what, of what the value at risk, in other words, the difference between what we have the property on the assessment roll for and what the assessment, what the, excuse me, what the appellant says it should be worth is about $70 billion. But of that $70 billion, about half of it is with 10 companies. So you file an appeal. If you're Apple, Google, uh, Hewlett Packard, whatever, you file an appeal and you have a potential payday of, uh, I don't know, $10 million or more. 50 million, maybe if you looked at Apple. Uh, how much would you pay in, in high priced lawyers, expert witnesses for a potential $10 million payday? Okay. Uh, and so all of my senior appraisers that I have now, I am sure would be attracted away by the very people because one, they have the skill set. And, and if I'm an appraiser in, in the assessor's office in Santa Clara County, and I get a call to say, we'll quadruple your salary because, because, because the money at stake. So even though the skill set doesn't exist for me to get the 50 new appraisers I need, and these are not entry level appraisers, these are senior appraisers that are capable of appraising and assessing office buildings and shopping centers that would be depleted by people that were filing appeals. That's another uh, crisis on, on, the, uh, you know, on the horizon for, for assessors. Great, well, thank you. I think we're gonna um, uh, have to leave it at that though. I, I know that there's a lot of interest in the split rate uh, issue and and uh, perhaps at some other uh, some other time we can have you or, or uh, some other person that you can uh, 
recommend come and talk about that because that sounds like a, a much more appealing alternative than what what is currently on the ballot well it unfortunately there isn't a lot to talk about it i've been talking about it for well over a year and most of the people who should know about this have never thought about it including including the lao who said oh we didn't realize that's an option uh, so it hasn't gotten much traction. So sounds like you're it. So we'll be, we'll be in touch with your staff to see when we can get you back. And in the meantime, thank you for uh, sharing your time this afternoon with us. Thank you for uh, uh, for your work and uh, and uh, thanks for helping us get through this very difficult period. Well, thank you, Rick, and thank Anjali as well. I always enjoy talking to you folks, uh, even remotely. Uh, and hopefully, uh, next year we can do this live. I mean, not live live, but in person live. Absolutely. Thanks, Larry. You bet. Well, Larry raises an interesting point. One of the upsides of all of this is that uh, uh, parking and traffic has gotten much easier to deal with for these meetings. So uh, uh, that's a little silver lining to uh, these, uh, these challenging times. Well, if um, taxes are always on people's mind, uh, another critical substance, let's call it, that is uh, that is essential to our lives and, and uh, we take far too much for granted is water. And so this afternoon, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Mike Potter. Mike is the uh, Community Outreach Program Supervisor for Valley Water. And it's my pleasure to have him here this afternoon and talk about Talk about water. Who knew that water was going to be so important? Uh, actually, we all do. Uh, but uh, Mike, if you could talk a little bit about uh, what Valley Water is working on and we, what we might be looking forward to uh, in the months ahead. Absolutely. It's great to be here, Rick. I'm also joined with, uh, by Lisa Flores, uh, who I think uh, is familiar to you as one of your, uh, from our Office of Government Relations, and she uh, uh, covers the you know, Chamber of Commerce. And also with Chelsea Busick, who uh, is a uh, recent hire at Valley Water from San Jose State and, and who is indispensable with uh, making sure that these presentations go off without a hitch, uh, among many other things that she's doing. And then Don Rocha, uh, uh, our, newly, uh, uh, our newest teammate, on the, uh, in our, the head of our Office of Government Relations uh, recently announced. So, um, it's well, very good to be back with the Cooper County Chamber. There's Don joining us from the headquarters. Hello, well, thanks for having us. Um, I see a number of familiar names on this call from my prior work uh, when I was with the legislature. I worked for Senator Byron Schur for nine, almost nine years, uh, and would come to a number of Cupertino Chamber of Commerce meetings uh, back when Rick was a. Uh, a staffer uh, and, and uh, working with the city. So uh, it feels great to be here. Um, we've got a short uh, slide presentation and a, a video that we'll share, and then we'll be happy to answer lots of questions at the end. Um, and Lisa, are you on? Yes, um, but it won't allow me to put on the video. I think it's blocked on the presenter side. Well, that's, that's our loss. Uh, Lisa's uh, a, a fellow in our Office of Government Relations. She's one of the smartest people I've met in my time at Valley Water, uh, which has been about six months. Um, why don't we uh, go ahead and kick it off, and, and then uh, if you have questions, put them in the chat. Uh, Chelsea, get the slide started, and then Lisa there will, we will kick us off. Hi, I'm Lisa Flores from Valley Water. I'm the fellow for the Office of Government Relations, and I'm joined by my amazing colleague here, Mike Potter, who works with me at Valley Water, which is formerly known as Santa Clara Valley Water District. First off, we want to thank you for allowing us to present to the chamber today. We are here to share general information with the members of the community about two things, who we are. Um, we are actually a public agency with a public elected board of directors. 
as well as our exploratory efforts to renew the Safe Clean Water and Natural Flood Protection Program. We want to ensure that our community is well informed and we will be playing a short video and showing a short PowerPoint presentation to explain this effort. Our brief presentation, um, after a brief presentation, we will allow time for questions or suggestions, but we do ask that you hold off those questions to the end so we can get through the material. Um, before we get started, I want to begin by sharing the Valley Water is an integrated water resource management agency that serves the entire county by providing safe, clean water, flood protection, and environmental stewardship. We are a local government agency, but we are considered a special district with our own elected board of officials. With our own elected board that represents seven various areas of the county. Before we begin, I want to take this opportunity to say that during this pandemic, our agency continues to provide safe clean water around the clock, 24-7, 365 days a year. As a public utility, we are considered an essential service provider and we continue to provide safe clean water, flood control and environmental stewardship on behalf of 2 million residents and commuters in 15 cities, as well as 14,700 private well owners. I want to reassure the group that, our, that your water supply remains safe and there is no impact due to COVID-19 on our water supply or your tap water and that we, our employees, remain committed to operating our critical infrastructure water treatment plants during this time. So in terms of water, we got you covered. Valley Water's work is founded on three pillars. I will now go on to define those three pillars, starting with the first one, which is providing clean, reliable water. Our water supply is not all local. We import water from Altera County through the San Sacramento San Joaquin Delta, and that forms an important part of our water portfolio, helping us to weather droughts and meet demand. In, average, in an average year, we import 55% of our water supply to the Delta, get 30% from local sources such as rainfall and storm runoff into our reservoirs, get 10% from local conservation, and recycle 5% of the water that we use in the county. Our um, second pillar is flood protection. Valley Water is the flood control agency for Santa Clara County, which means that we invest in and execute projects and programs that help protect lives, homes, businesses throughout the county. Our third and final pillar is a healthy community. And um, this pillar provides healthy creeks and ecosystems. As part of this focus, we take care of streams and watersheds, partner with other agencies to provide trails and recreation opportunities, restore and improve habitat, host cleanup days, work to prevent polluted runoff, and work with Creekside property owners to help them be stewards of the county streams and ecosystems. We also work with other agencies to address issues such as homeless encampments, which can um, cause extensive environmental damage. And Valley Water's environmental work protects and restores habitats and encourages the, re the return of endangered species. Um, on to slide three, which is the next slide. Um, this speaks of what occurred in December 2019, which is when Valley Water's Board of Directors directed staff to explore opportunities to enhance and update the existing Safe Clean Water and Natural Flood Protection Program, which is funded through a special parcel tax by over 74% per, of voters in November of 2012. As part of the potential renewal measure, we are really seeking ways on how to build upon the existing program in terms of making it stronger and providing it and improving it so we can better meet the future needs of the entire county. This replacement and renewal of the existing program would begin in fiscal year 2022 and extend for a minimum of 15 years throughout longer periods, the longer periods are being explored, including a look at the unrepealed by borders option. Currently, we're in the exploratory phase where we are simply gathering community input on the program and what the community desires to see as part of this effort. To then present back to the board in June or July for the ultimate decision and, where the, and whether they will continue to pursue this idea this fall. Now I will begin um, to speak of um, the timing of this. 
As our community contends with our new challenges, such as climate change, natural disasters, population growth, and uncertain important water supplies in 2020, we are now gathering community's input to update and enhance the Safe Clean Water and Natural Flood Protection Program to better meet the future needs of Santa Clara County. As you can see, this slide lists several external and internal conditions. It, it is important to note that funding for CIP projects can meet key performance measures, which are KPIs for locally funded projects, but not for community preferred or enhanced level of protection. Um, our next slide here shows the how, um, which we are actually using stakeholder input as well as community engagement. And we are constructing a community per preferred plan for Santa Clara County by doing the following um, things such as um, internal brainstorming for workshops, as well as public participation to gather input. Our next slide here um, begins to speak of our priorities. Um, these priorities were developed with community input back in 20, 2011 with thousands of residents who provided input into the process. Um, for priorities A through priority B. We are now looking for looking at a new concept that has come about with current community input. We're in the program development phase and have a new priority titled support public health, public safety for our community. Um, now I'm going to ask my colleague Chelsea to pause the PowerPoint and play a short video before I ask my colleague Mike to go in depth explaining these priorities. How important is safe clean water and natural flood protection to you? At Valley Water, we're securing a reliable supply of water for the future to keep the water running no matter what public emergency we face. What matters most to you? Do you support potentially expanding our reservoirs? Like Pacheco in Southern Santa Clara County, a project that could hold as much water as all of our reservoirs combined. Or fixing Anderson Dam to ensure our 2 million residents have a safe, reliable drinking water supply for the future, even in the face of earthquakes, emergencies, droughts, climate change, and population growth? Or is it most important to you that the water that flows through our community is free of toxins and contaminants? At Valley Water, we partner year-round with local organizations and thousands of volunteers to remove litter from our local creeks, streams, and the bay, while we work on projects countywide to remove contaminants such as mercury from our reservoirs, like Calero, Guadalupe, and Almaden Lake, providing a healthy environment for fish, birds, and wildlife. Or perhaps you support our work to keep our homes, schools, and businesses safe from floods. Our projects along the Guadalupe River in San Jose, Permanente in Mountain View, Upper Yagas Creek in Gilroy and Morgan Hill, San Francisco Creek in Palo Alto, and the San Francisco Bay shoreline are resulting in the removal of thousands of parcels from flood zones and helping lower the cost of your flood insurance premiums. If keeping your water supply clean and reliable, your community safe from floods, and protecting the environment in Santa Clara County is important to you, we want to hear your voice. We're exploring ways to enhance and update the Safe Clean Water and Natural Flood Protection Program that will help us better meet the challenges of the future. Go to safecleanwater.org, take our two minute survey, tell us what matters most to you, and let's work together to keep safe clean water and natural flood protection for all. Thank you, Chelsea. If we could start back with slide eight. The PowerPoint, there we go. I don't know about you, but after I watch that video, I always want some uh, bell peppers. Uh, those, those red peppers look good. Um, so the, the, the five current priorities plus the one that we're under consideration, the first one is priority A, which is ensure a safe, reliable water supply. And the types of projects that are currently been funded and that we anticipate would be included in a future measure um, are protecting our water supply, water quality, dams, flood protection channels from drought, and building sustainable locally controlled water supply projects. 
One of the projects we completed was the Main and Madrone Avenue Pipeline Restoration. This allowed us to reach current and future groundwater recharge demand in Morgan Hill and South Santa Clara County. The two pipelines can now convey local and imported water from Anderson Reservoir and Santa Clara Conduit for groundwater recharge via the Main Avenue Recharge Ponds and the Madrone Channel. Um, we have some pipeline reliability projects. I'm sure John Tang is very happy to hear that uh, since uh, they're one of our best customers and biggest customers. Um, the project constructs four line valves at various locations along the east, west, Snell, uh, treated water pipelines in Saratoga, Cupertino, and San Jose. And the big potential project in this category would be the Pacheco Reservoir, which you saw a little bit of. Um, on the way to San Luis Reservoir, if you look over your shoulder on Highway uh, 152, there is a uh, small uh, 5,500 acre foot reservoir. It's, it's, it's not really providing a whole lot of uh, water retention. In fact, the creek runs dry during the summer and dry months. This would expand that dramatically and be a tremendous source of off-stream storage so that we could import water from San Luis Reservoir during the time when it's full and when the water is cool, uh, we could avoid the algae problems that sometimes crop up there and provide us with enough water for 1.4 million residents for up to a year, should there be a problem with levees in the Delta or anywhere else. So it's, it's a really um, uh, crucial uh, large project that actually enhances the environment for the fish in that river by allowing the stream to run cold uh, year round. And so the, the, the fish there will, will flourish, um, ideally. Um, priority B uh, is uh, focused on reducing toxins, hazard, and contaminants in our waterways. Um, and that uh, allows us to uh, fund the Hazardous Material Management Response Program, allows Valley Water to continue to provide a local toll-free number to report hazardous spills 24-7. Staff will respond within two hours of the initial report with spill cleanup uh, in our water right-of-way. Uh, Valley Water is responsible for about 278 miles of uh, uh, riparian corridors in our county, uh, which is a lot, but there's actually over 800 miles uh, total in our county. So, uh, but the ones that we're responsible for, we will definitely respond in a timely manner. Um, when we this also funds uh, supporting volunteer cleanup efforts and education uh, for things like National River Cleanup Day, uh, California Coastal Cleanup Day, the Great American Pickup, and the Adopt a Creek program. So that's a, a terrific category that, that's been very successful. On priority C, uh, we're dedicated to protecting our water uh, supply and to protect uh, from earthquakes and natural disasters. So this category, priority, category C, will uh, work towards things like the Anderson Dam Seismic Retrofit Project, which uh, is, is just a tremendously complicated but super important project. That, that reservoir is our, currently our largest reservoir and, and uh, we can't keep it full because of the seismic concerns, uh, which uh, it makes it harder for us to meet all of our water supply needs. Uh, when we can't keep it full. And, and, and uh, we, we store imported water there and we also uh, use that to recharge the groundwater in, in, in South San Jose. This project covers the earthquake retrofitting uh, and uh, there have been some recent community meetings that have uh, updated that project. So I'd encourage you to check out our project page if you're interested in that project uh, on our website. Um, priority D is to restore wildlife habitat and provide open space. It's a priority that didn't really exist before the District Act was changed back in uh, uh, 2000, uh, found that uh, when they were working on the original Safe Clean Creeks measure, voters weren't interested in taxing themselves uh, if, if Valley Water didn't incorporate habitat, wildlife, and open space in its mission. So the District's Enabling Act was amended. I worked with the legislature that, legislator that did that, Senator Schur, uh, and so now we have a category. So the types of things that are funded in this project uh, are conservation of habitat lands and watersheds, uh, commitment to the Habitat Agency, which uh, helps a lot of other big projects happen as well. Uh, it's what we use to revitalize stream and upland habitat, um, improving fish habitat and, and, and passage improvement. Uh, a number of these types of things are important to help maintain a healthy steelhead trout populations and improve fish passage. Um, next priority, priority E, is to provide flood protection to homes, business, schools, streets, and highways. Uh, this is the type of project that uh, funds things like the San Francisco uh, Creek Flood Protection Project that you saw. You saw the bridge uh, that, that connects East Palo Alto and Palo Alto, and they call it the Friendship Bridge. Um, there's more work to be done on that. This is a part that's been completed. It's from uh, Highway 101 to the Bay, and uh, the, there's 
another significant uh, portion of that, that that is at risk of flooding. Um, the other types of things uh, closer to Cupertino is the Permanente Creek Flood Protection Project. Uh, ultimately culminates at, at McKelvey Park, which you saw a picture of the ball field. We took two existing baseball fields and dug that down over a period of years, 16 feet, and they now uh, serve as a flood retention pond if there's a high water event. Uh, but they rebuilt the ball field so that you can continue to have uh, uh, community assets. So that project just opened in February and uh, was, was a tremendous success. The long haul um, and other parts of the Permanente Creek closer to Cupertino is near the Rancho San Antonio, um, where we're still working on doing archaeological work and construction, but it is making uh, uh, significant progress and we, we hope to wrap that one up this year. Um, the other major project that you will uh, be familiar with is the Cowdy Creek from Montague Expressway to Tully Road. It's funded through the Safe Clean Creeks and that, that there are actually three community meetings coming up in the next two weeks uh, to talk about the completion of the planning phase of that project and uh, the board's consideration of the engineering report as that moves forward towards construction. Uh, Sunnyvale East West Channel, the San Francisco Bay to Inverness Way, uh, not too far from where you are. Uh, Bay Shoreline work, San Francisco Creek again, and Upper Penitentia, those are all covered under this, this category. This is a very important section. Um, and then the potential new priority, Priority F, is to support public health, public safety for our community. Um, we, uh, uh, one of our most successful grant programs was a water to go. You may have seen these at schools where they uh, can fill a, bottle of water, a water bottle uh, type of drinking fountain. And so we gave out all those grants already. This would replenish those funds and, and we try to uh, bridge that to other agencies and nonprofit organizations as well. Um, and then to study and test uh, and, uh, new water conservation programs uh, through this program. Um, next slide. The, the key part of, of, of what we're doing today and, and coming out to you and talking about this is is to hear your voice. So we'd love for you to take our survey to help uh, shape this program. Uh, if there are uh, uh, concerns or questions, you can. there's an open-ended part of this as well, but what, what are your priorities? We wanna develop a community preferred plan and the way to do that is to get community input. And so this is a, a link to our, our survey and we'd, we'd love for everyone on this call to take it. We've had uh, almost 15,000 completed surveys at this point. They got close to that uh, two years ago when, uh, sorry, in 2011 when they developed the uh, 2012 measure. And so we're, we're very excited to be able to catch up to that in our, in our shorter time span here. Um, the the uh, other part of this proposal is, is, is what's being considered is, is an extension of the existing program. This isn't a new or on top of the, uh, to, to uh, uh, add to the existing program. This would be to uh, enhance it and but but keep it at the same level, if that makes sense. And I'm happy to answer uh, questions about that. If you go to the next slide, you'll see some of our uh, we have a great social media team that has put out a lot of messaging. Uh, uh, on the next slide, you can see our Twitter feed and our Facebook page, and then we have a microsite that talks about this project specifically at SafeCleanWater.org, and and you can get uh, additional information there. And if you, you know, be sure to make uh, sure Rick has our contact information if there's a technical question. I've been at Valley Water for almost six months now. Don's been here uh, less than six weeks. And so uh, I am by no means the, the water expert. Uh, and so if you have a, a hard question, we'll, we'll be sure to get you an accurate answer. So I'm happy to, to take any questions that you might have at this time. Rick already shared the link. Great, this is really cool. thank you, Mike. Yeah, I saw the, uh, saw the link, uh, but I, uh, I included a uh, clickable link in the chat. Very nice, very nice. Uh, we I'm very happy. That. You're, you're welcome to boo me if you want, but I'm um, happy if you don't. No, it's that's... just not the same. Sorry. The, uh, it's, uh, you know, I, I've heard it said, and, and uh, I think it's especially true for, for uh, water, that uh, if you do your job well, no one knows that you've done anything at all. And unfortunately, water is such a fundamentally precious resource that we, we can't afford the luxury of waiting for things to go wrong. So appreciate your uh, organization taking a proactive view and, and a sustainable view at the, the challenges that water faces and our community faces. Um, yeah. I, um, 
John Tang appreciates your work and wanted uh, to ensure the safe and reliable water supply for our region. It's especially important now. Um, what's interesting is we see some of the debates happening in the community about uh, whether or not climate change is real or why it's happening. I think that we all can uh, agree that there's, there's more energy in the system. So our, our highs are gonna be higher and our lows are gonna be lower. We're gonna have incredibly wet years and we will continue to have dry years. Um, we would for sure say that there, there, we've seen more extreme weather. And yes. so the extremes, yes. you know, extremely dry or extremely wet and, and some of the um, things that we're working towards, especially with the Anderson project is to be able to accommodate that. The idea of having Pacheco will give us an extra layer of resilience uh, and, and control our own destiny. So if there was a problem with the levees in the Central Valley, which would be catastrophic, uh, we, would, we would have a local source to continue. And, and this valley uh, has, has adapted when there have been shortfalls by conserving water and, and conserving water going forward on, on the way we do landscape. That's always complicated because you have an organization that's based on a certain amount of water usage that does impact, but we we encourage uh, water conservation, water recycling. Some of the things, we get 55% of our water supply through the Delta, 30% from local sources, and 10% uh, from water conservation, and then 5% we get from uh, water reuse, uh, the purple pipe, and, and we have an advanced purification plant out in Albiso that, that actually takes the purple pipe water and essentially creates distilled water almost. Uh, and so uh, we, we, we are uh, coming up with ways to be adaptable, but those are, those are costly investments, so we've got to be careful how it scales. Uh, well, Mike, you touched on a, a couple of uh, questions uh, that we've received. Uh, AB, 3005, 3005, I believe that's on the assembly floor. Is that, can you talk to, to that at all? Sure, we, we uh, this is legislation introduced by assembly member Robert Rebus uh, to help expedite the uh, Anderson Dam project uh, and to uh, um, allow for uh, this to move more quickly. And that bill passed unanimously out of the first policy committee, unanimously out of the uh, Assembly Appropriations Committee, and uh, is uh, we're hoping to be on consent. But it's it's been uh, a great partnership. I think uh, John can correct me if I'm wrong. I think our local delegation is completely supportive of this and on board uh, as as co-authors. And so it's uh, and, and I know that uh, Congresswoman Lofton has been um, uh, assuring folks that that uh, she's watching their votes as well. So. It's, it's gotten great support and, and you know, uh, she represents Morgan Hill, which if, if, if there's a catastrophic problem for constituents and, and we, you know, that water would flow to Watsonville and to the Bay. So it would be, uh, we've got to fix it. And, and it's, it's a very complicated project, but it's something that, uh, that we've, they've re reshuffled the uh, group that's working on it. We've got, I think, kind of a very uh, sophisticated operation now and, and are working in partnership with the federal uh, Energy Regulatory Commission to address their concerns and and uh, and and the good the, I don't want to say the good news the benefit of having them uh, be so vigorous in getting this rebuilt is that uh, it it is uh, uh, streamlined some of the process to only be very lengthy instead of tremendously lengthy. Yeah, I think there's a uh, certainly our our board which uh, adopted a, a strong support position. Uh, understood the difference between uh, having reservoirs not full because there wasn't enough water and having uh, reservoirs not being full because they can't hold water. And right. uh, that's certainly, that latter scenario is, is absolutely not, not acceptable and, and not in anyone's interest. Uh, you had mentioned uh, purple pipe. Can you talk about that a little? Because certainly as we, as we see these uh, dry spells, um, uh, I think there's gonna be a, a growing interest in uh, purple pipe and what it represents. Uh, um, I, I can generally talk about it. I, I, uh, that is a partnership between uh, the sewage treatment control plant and Valley Water to uh, get that, um, uh, we take 
the uh, cleaned water from the sewage treatment plant and use it for irrigation purposes. It's not, um, uh, in, in, in many parts of the world, that might be, you know, clean up to reuse. It is, it is uh, uh, an expensive undertaking to run pipe from uh, the north part of our county in Alviso uh, to where it is needed in the uh, southern parts of the county. Uh, the Calpine Power Plant, I think, is one of the largest users of that. They use that for their cooling, and they, uh, when as a part of the entitlement for that project, uh, I believe ran uh, that uh, paid for a substantial expansion out to South San Jose. Um, and, and we're hopeful that more and more parks and 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 you know some golf courses and others use that. But it's it, we'd like to see more water done. The city of San Jose and the sewage plant was getting in trouble for um, putting too much pure water in the bay and 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 changing the salinity. So they needed to come up with a solution to reduce how much, uh, you know, uh, non-salty water was going in the bay. And so this, the, the purple pipe was the solution to that. Uh, and and uh, there are a number of the tech campuses in North San Jose that use that for their landscape water. Okay. Now, uh, back to uh, the presentation, uh, of course, you're... Uh, soliciting input and we we want to be able to make sure you get as much input as possible through this uh, survey how long will the survey remain open great question uh we're, we're trying to wrap that up our board is going to consider uh in the next month our board in july will consider whether to go forward with uh the uh renewal and uh and, and change to the safety and water program uh either on the fort for uh meeting of the 14th uh or the 28th the deadline is, is in August, so yeah, I think it's the 28th. Okay, so we would encourage everybody to respond by uh, uh, the end of June, say? That Absolutely, work? that would be terrific. Uh, okay. It takes and then, less than two minutes. It's a short <laughs> survey. It's Great. Simple is good. Um, and then uh, it sounds like at that point, then uh, your board would decide what would be on the, if and what would be on the November ballot. Correct. There's, they're going to have a report, uh, uh, preliminary report uh, on June 23rd uh, of what would be included. So we are trying to take this survey information and develop a draft. Um, we are still adding uh, input to it, but, but uh, uh, the 23rd is, and you'll, you'll see that posted on the agenda the week before uh, so that you can consider and, and, and review what uh, is, is being heard by the board. Uh, and, and, the Great. Mix that goes okay. Into the it's not probably going to be a short document, so I think a little lead time is helpful. <laughs> well, super. In, in uh, well, with that, uh, certainly I'd, I'd love to have uh, your team share if there's a uh, an email address for our attendees to follow up with any questions. But uh, beyond that, uh, I just want to wrap things up. Respect people's time. We're we're a few minutes over, but. Um, Thanks for Valley Water for being here. And wait a minute, I'm just, I just remembered we are running over, but it's been a busy week. Thank you, Valley Water. I actually want to hand it off to, uh, to the city of Cupertino. It's been a busy week. And uh, I know that Angela Sway with the city of Cupertino has uh, quite a bit to share with us, but uh, thanks, Mike. Thank your team. Thank welcome, you. Don welcome Don and uh, uh, go Spartans. Thank you. Don't forget though, Mike, we're also looking for a letter of endorsement or support as well. So that's part of our ask. Okay. Uh, you, uh, Don and Mike, you can follow up, uh, follow up with uh, me or Anjali and we can uh, make sure we, we can get you what you need. Will do. Thank you very much. Appreciate sure. your time. All right. Angela, uh, excuse me, Angela. You are it. That's what I'm <laughs> pointing you. to. That's it. She's right there. Excellent. Uh, Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Rick. Um, I will keep this short and sweet, but again, I'm, I'm just trying to be able to provide updates to you all, and you're welcome to follow up with me afterwards. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen uh, so that we can review the development matrix uh, for June. So if you can all see that here, and I'll try to do minimize this a little. There we go. Uh, so again, our usual protocol, things in gray are updates. So for the Westport Cupertino um, project, the Oak site, uh, 
although planning commission had approved it five to zero on May 12th. Uh, my understanding is uh, the applicant has made changes to the project. So at this point, um, it has to be decided if this, the revisions or the changes have to go back to planning commission or just go straight to um, city council. So that still hasn't been decided, uh, but that's the update on that project. Uh, the next is the forum uh, and the final uh, one of 23 villas has occurred for their permitting. The BMR, which is the below market rate linkage fees, of uh, council heard that and approved that on May 19th. And then the short-term rental ordinance uh, is scheduled to go to city council on July 7th. So that is, and I will stop sharing that. Uh, as you usually know, that uh, development matrix is posted on the city's website under the economic development section. So you're welcome to look at that month's um, or this month's matrix as well as past uh, matrix. And, um, and the yes. short term rental, uh, Angela, that's the uh, Airbnb Correct. type type Correct. rentals. OK, great. Uh, yes. Yeah, so that ordinance deals with that and how to collect the information and collect taxes okay. from those types of rentals. Thank you. Correct. Um, and then just uh, really quick, if you'd like, I can give um, updates on the Cupertino or Please. COVID related matters. Sure. So uh, for this week, if you have not yet heard, uh, we understand there is a BLM uh, demonstration scheduled for tomorrow, Saturday at 4 p.m. Uh, the staging area is going to be the park near um, the sheriff's substation on South De Anza. Uh, and we understand there's going to be a marching route uh, around that area. Um, so we've just been trying to alert as many businesses as possible. Um, the sheriff's department and office has assured us they will be on hand just to make sure everything is safe for the community as well as um, the marchers, the protesters. Um, and, and we are just assuming and hoping this, this will all go safely and smoothly. But again, if you see anything dangerous, um, the sheriff's office does recommend that you uh, call 911. Uh, also, uh, in an effort to support our local businesses and to coincide with the county's revised order to allow uh, outdoor dining, the city later this afternoon at a special council meeting um, is looking to enact a special urgency ordinance uh, that will allow for an uh, application process for special outdoor dining in Cupertino. So if you're familiar with um, the dining regulations in Cupertino, a CUP is normally required. Um, this is just a one page uh, application. Uh, we are expediting this. Uh, hopefully it's a really quick turnaround. Uh, what's required will be a site plan to show how you're doing your seating. Um, and then if you are on private property, you are asked that um, the property owner does sign off on this. Um, and again, there is no um, fee for this. Uh, we're just trying to help our businesses, the restaurants get up and running as quickly as possible, but doing it safely. Um, so updates on that and to see the application once council has approved this, you can go to cupertino.org forward slash COVID-19 business info, uh, as well as I believe it will be on the permitting section of the city's website. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to share was uh, sanitation services for unhoused uh, residents here in Cupertino. Uh, the city will be providing, is looking to provide portable toilets and hand washing stations, and also uh, partnering with Recology uh, to provide and offer trash removal, I believe, uh, up to twice a week uh, for the two encampments. And that's all I have, but I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Great. Uh, I don't see any questions. Thank you, everyone, for staying a little late. Um, thank you. Angela for the, uh, your leadership and uh, uh, Deb and the, the city council acting decisively to, to help, help us reopen our community. Uh, and with that, thank you everyone. We will be, um, uh, if there's any interest, let us know or actually let Lori know. We shared her email. If you, uh, we've always had interest in, in Larry Stone's prepared comments. 
Have a great day. Have a safe weekend. And uh, we'll see you soon.